a farm uh, in Rawls or in Crosby County right east of here with my dad and my uncle. Uh, we farm primarily cotton and um, look at my time, make sure my, see where we're at. Um, primarily cotton is what pulls the train in our operation. Um, we do a little bit of corn, uh, some milo and some grains like that, you know, but that's generally, we have some original plant, but mainly is an option behind failed cotton. And we're doing a little bit of cattle grazing. I, I hate to even mention that with the vardamans in the room um, because the way they do it, I mean, they make it look easy. Um, it looks really good and it's very impressive and I can't wait to hear Lacey's talk uh, later today. We just kind of piddle around and have some people bring some cows out when we got too much cover. But anyway, that's kind of an overview of our operation. Um, I took this picture in 2022 when I was flying back. It was about this time of year. Uh, in March, and I was coming back from Dallas, um, flying back, I can't remember what I was doing, but flying back to Lubbock. And I took this out of the window between Rawls and Lorenzo. I was trying to get pretty close to where I farm. And this is facing to the south. <clears throat> and as you can see from this picture, and I'm sure most of y'all in here remember what last year was like. I mean, it wasn't, it's not like we're a whole lot wetter now than what we were then, but Last year, you know, we had no moisture through the fall and into the spring. You know, we went for about an 11 month period with no rainfall. And this picture, I think, sums that up pretty well as you can kind of see, or maybe you can or can't. I could see it when I was sitting in the seat, but most of the bar ditches are silted in in this picture, you know, between these farms. And that's a pretty depressing looking picture, you know, flying over and flying back in, looking at that and realize you've got to make a living farming and stuff like this. And it just reminded me a lot, you know, if two years can be compared, uh, I would say 22 and 11 um, had a lot of similarities, I would say. And it got me to thinking about 2011, and 2011 was a big change in our operation. It's when we got started on our, we were on our start of our journey of soil health. But in 2011, um, I was all conventional tillage. We were rotating a little bit, um, but very conventionally till, very conventionally plowing. And... I started farming in 2009 when I got out of college. And those of you who know me, um, uh, if you can believe it, I was even more full of myself then and didn't lack for confidence. But in 2009, when I got out and started farming, we had a couple of good years and growing some good cotton. And I thought, hey, this cotton farming thing's pretty easy. You know, it was a time of relatively, you know, not extremes, I would say, in weather events. And then 2011 showed up. And 2011 um, let me know who was in charge, and it wasn't me um, in 2011. It made me realize that there's many, many things in farming um, that I can't control and I have no, no charge of. Um, and as a wise man I know once said, um, I've never seen my best year or my worst year coming. And I think that's indicative of how little control we have over our situations as farmers, and especially when it comes to profitability at the end of the year. Because profitability, so many things have to line up for us to be profitable. You know, that's why a couple of years ago was so special as a cotton farmer where we had good yield and good price together. Um, and I heard from other guys just how rare that is, and they're right. Um, because you think about what's in our control as a producer, um, and it's not what John Deere is charging for equipment, you know, which by the way has gone up like 12% every year for the past three years. Um, it's definitely not the markets. We can't control those. Um, you know, we can work around some of this stuff, maybe it's equipment, using some older equipment or, you know, marketing. I'm a very poor marketer. So I thought I was gonna be selling cotton for $1.50 this year and I sold a bunch for 80 cents. And so that's how much control I have over the cotton market and how good of a marketer, um, you know, that I am. Um, it's for sure not input prices, as was demonstrated by this last year, that we have no control over. Um, and for sure, it's not any of the weather. So what can we control? And that's what made me get to thinking. And that rolled into um, when 2013, when RN had the first no-till meeting out at his barn um, in Petersburg. And when I went and saw that, went to that meeting and saw what he was talking about, what they were doing, him and Kelly, and a few other guys that were there that had been doing this for a while, it just made me, got me to thinking about how to be a more resilient producer and all that stuff really hit home uh, that they were talking about. And so this is essentially some of the stuff we started, started with or some of the things, you know, of, that they were talking about and what we've learned over the years of why no-till. Um, 
<clears throat> and especially no-till out here in West Texas. Well, less soil erosion. Um, everybody around here is probably familiar with this. Up until a couple of years ago, I thought this was a problem you guys south and west of Lubbock had. In Crosby County, I was, oh, our soils, they, they don't blow, you know, they won't lose a fence or a car vehicle, you know, you know, a vehicle or something parked too long. But this is in Crosby County, it's a neighbor of mine. This is some knee-high CRP grass, or it was, until my neighbor to the south this last year, it just, the wind blew all winter long and buried this, you know, three foot tall grass. Um, and so we know we have an erosion problem. It can be from water, but as big, much time as anything, it can be from wind. Fuel savings, um, what we've seen, just maintenance and um, wear and tear on equipment. We've seen a 60% reduction in uh, fuel expense. And when we started doing this, it was a really big deal. And that's when diesel was at a dollar to two dollars a gallon for red diesel. You know, when diesel's three to four dollars a gallon, um, it's even that you know makes even that much bigger of a difference um, starting out with maintenance and equipment. You know, on equipment. Uh, back when we were plowing pretty heavy, I mean, you know, eight hundred to a thousand hours on a tractor a year, you know, wasn't unheard of. And now most tractors, except for the two to three we use to plant, um, and the sprayer sees more hours, but you know, we're doing good to do one oil change a year on a tractor, just because we don't, we're not having to trade them in. I'm not, you know, there's certain equipment we gotta have, but wearing a bunch of tractors out going across the field, you know, 20 times in a year just, just isn't it. And also wear and tear on employees um, is the other thing that I didn't realize, you know, was a benefit to this when we started. Um, you need to think about the equipment and fuel savings and, you know, plow shanks and things like that, bearings, but you don't think of employees. And it's been a long time, you know, about the time when, you know, a sand fighter like this, an eight row sand fighter is a pretty old piece of equipment now. Uh, being able to retain good employees, because I, I don't know, I haven't seen anybody run a sand fighter like this in a long time. Maintaining good employees is more important now than I would say than it probably has ever been. Because um, now a 16 row sand fighter is a small piece of equipment. Um, that you can't just put anybody on that, but especially now 24 row sand fighters are now more common. Um, and putting some, you just any guy that you find to come run this or a spray rig or a, you know, a big folding planter, equipment has gotten more complicated as we know. And so keeping and retaining good employees has become even more important. Um, and what I've noticed is it's not like 20 or 30 years ago when me and every single one of my neighbors was running a sand fighter on Saturday and Sunday. Um, now, about maybe half the people are running a sand fighter. Or guys who maybe a good employee works for a neighbor across the road can see, well, the Verettes don't run a sand fighter every weekend, you know, when I'd like to be at my son's baseball game. Um, they're not doing any of that. And so employees see this stuff too. And so less employee burnout, less employee wear, has been another uh, benefit of this. Go to the next. <laughs> uh, better water infiltration. As you can see from the picture, this was a couple of years ago where the one on the bottom and the right was my neighbors after we got five inches of rain. You can see how much it washed out and you can see our field up on the left where it didn't. And Dr. LaSalle was talking about a story of uh, guys walking in these fields and you can feel the soil structure. Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, my crop insurance agent was telling me, had a story of we walk, he was checking some fields for me after a bad hail and just kind of looking around. And it, I just thought it was an interesting anecdote from somebody I don't, I'm, he may think differently, but um, he knows that we're no-till and you know, we don't plow and plant some covers, but I just not like I beat him up with this stuff all the time about infiltration and soil structure and all of this. But he had the comment, he walked in my neighbor's field, and they were right across the road from each other, and he walked in my neighbor's field that had no covers, conventionally plowed. And of course, you know, I think all the, the crops are destroyed, but um, in both fields, but in my neighbor's field is conventionally tilled, you know, it was slicked off, the top half inch or inch was wet, the field was still relatively hard, it was a quick, three or four inches of rain, you know, in the matter of hours. And so it was a really hard pounding rain. So we walked in this field, and it's just like he normally would have expected. His shoes got a little muddy, and the ground was still pretty hard. And then he walked across the turn row into mine, which had been no-till for about seven or eight years. And the first thing he noticed is we had cover on the ground, so his shoes weren't as muddy. It was a big part of it. But also he said when you could immediately tell when you stepped into the field, there was a difference in the way the soil felt. 
and our no-till field was much softer to the touch, you know, and had some spring to it because it had absorbed a lot more of that rain. I'm not saying we got all of it or anything like that, but I know we captured more than my conventionally tilled neighbor did. And to me, that's as big a benefit. I mean, the fuel saving, some of this is, is really good and it's part of it. But to me, better water infiltration and trying to be a better steward of what we're given and what we're blessed with, you know, because water is such a limiting factor in this part of the world. Um, it can't be overstated how important rainfall and precipitation is. And if you don't think so, you know, we just go for about three or four or five months, six months without it, and we realize how important it is. Um, and so being able to capture these, when we get a snow like we got in January, everybody can take advantage of that, and that's really good. Uh, a snow during the winter is very much a blessing, and it doesn't run off, it doesn't go away. But we generally don't get four and five inches of rain, you know, during the cool time of the year, and it doesn't generally fall over the course of three or four days. Um, it falls in the course of three or four hours, and it's in the spring or it's in the fall usually when we need it the most for a crop, you know, it's much closer by. And so being able to try to slow that rain down, keep it on the field as much and as long as possible has been one of the biggest benefits to this. Um, we've seen our seed beds, you know, firm up, be able to hold moisture better since we've stopped plowing this ground, you know, running behind a rod, everybody here knows who's, who's plowed before, you know, that ground is going to dry out to where that rod was run. And where we don't do that now, we're able to plant on much smaller percent of moisture, you know, a good inch rain or two inch rain goes a lot further on a no-till field with some cover on it than it did when I had a big bed and I'd knock the top out and I'd plowed it two or three times before that and thrown up a bed, <coughs> excuse me. And so the moisture goes a lot further. Um, and so it makes planting easier. You know, that seed bed stays moist for longer and gives me more confidence in my germination, you know, as opposed to that moisture trying to run away. Because the clock's ticking once you run a rod or once you run a field cultivator, it's gonna dry to where it was plowed and your clock is ticking on holding enough moisture next to that cotton seed you know, as long as you can to get it to germinate, because it's not like corn where we can bury it three or four knuckles deep and it'll stay wet. You know, we know cotton is a fickle plant and it's got to be right on that line of not dying and being able to push out, but that's also where it dries out the quickest. And we've also started to see, and this is partly because we're just planting less seed, but I never used to find earthworms as a kid. And now we find more earthworms in a foot or two of seed trench we dig it behind the planter than we do cotton seed. Um, in a foot or two of seed trench, it's not unheard but find five or six, seven earthworms. And it just, you know, the scale of it still boggles my mind. If, if I'm looking at an area of the field that's this big and I've got a 60 acre field, how many earthworms are in that field working all the time while I'm not there? Um, it's pretty amazing to think about. My um, rotational sequence, pretty much everything that I have with the exception of, I don't know, Probably 90% of our stuff is rotated half and half, dry land and irrigated. Um, and the, the reason being, or how we, I mean, we were always kind of half and half originally, just cutting water back on pivots. But, and I've got a picture I'll show here in a little bit, it's a good illustration of it, but when you take a year's time and lay that field out for a year, it gives you the, a lot of opportunity to grow cover. And it's just like the gentleman over here was asking earlier about planting a multi-species cover and not getting it up. I planted a lot of multi-species cover, lots of covers in general, and sometimes a year it just doesn't rain. And sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's not. And that's what's really difficult in our part of the world is growing a crop back to back without irrigation and being able to count on a good cover crop in between without supplemental irrigation. And where we're trying to do this and make this work, I'm not wanting to spend a bunch of money on irrigating cover crops because this system has to work in a very limited irrigation scenario and mainly dry land is where it needs to work. And it's not like I've got it all figured out, but we're working our way, hopefully trying to get to that direction. But that having that year set out gives us the opportunity to grow a crop. Um, and as we'll see here in a little bit, I've got a picture. Even this last year when we went 11 or 12 months with little to no precipitation, maybe more than about, you know, one to two inches, you know, in a year, um, I was able to germinate a cover crop but that's because we set out and waited for the time to plant and then planted our cover. So directly behind the cotton stripper, once we get a crop out or that cash crop or the combine, whatever it is, we're planting a cereal. Um, sometimes it's rye, 
you know, sometimes triticale or something like that, but yeah, I think any kind of cereal um, is when we're in there planting immediately, not disturbing it, not plowing, um, because especially behind cotton, as we know, cotton farmers are terrible wheat farmers because um, it's just so late in the year. Um, you know, early corn makes a good crop rotation for wheat, um, but when cotton comes off in October, November, and December, it's a terrible time, and so we still plant, we're just trying to get it planted. So, you know, we used to go in there and plow just a little bit and thought we were cleaning up some weeds and doing some of this and that. But our moisture is so limited that time of year. If we get a fall rain, um, it's getting cooler and our moisture is nearly pretty limited at that, that point in time during the year. And so we're trying to get it pl planted as close behind the cotton stripper as what we can. <laughs> That's going the wrong way. One more, okay? And so after we plant the rye, and the, we can do a few things with the rye, uh, for the most part, we just leave it, we select a few, or whatever the cereal is, but right now it's rye, we select a few circles like this year, and here for too long, I'm probably gonna water a few half circles just to try to ensure that I have some planting seed for myself for next year. But the vast majority of it is just on its own, it's dry land, I mean, it's all up and germinated, but you know, the rain would be really good on it, but it just goes until um, we either decide to, you know, terminate it, plant another crop, or you know, um, just let it, you know, maybe may just burn up. That's what it may do. Um, but the rise on its own, and then after that, if we need to supplement some cover, or we're trying to trying to work more radishes into the rotation. Traditionally, we had done a lot of multi-species, and I'd done a lot of hay grazer, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit about my experience with hay grazer, but. Through my own experience and also through working, working with the Australian uh, group and a guy, smart man out of Australia, Martin Hockey, um, who's told us what their research has found and it's shown on our own farm even before I was in the group, I knew it, but I was just too hard headed to realize it is that cotton like a uh, cereal and radish rotation works really well with cotton in this part of the world. Um, and some of the best crops I've had was behind radish and some sort of cereal and just trying to get back to where we could grow radishes and it's taken me a while to do it. I've tried to grow a lot of radishes in a multi-species system, and this is technically a multi-species system. I have rye in there. Um, I planted 10 pounds of rye and two pounds of radish in that picture. Um, about mid-August is when that was planted. But the things to take away and remember about radish is radish hates to be shaded out, and that's why I can never get it to grow beneath my hay grazer. Um, and it wants to be planted in August. It doesn't want to be planted in May, June, or July. Uh, it wants to be planted in August, maybe September, but ideally August is when it wants, because it has to have enough time. It's still a warm season crop. It has to have enough time to grow and put on some size before it gets too cold. But if you plant it too early, I've been told, I don't know if about radishes, you know, they can tend to go more reproductive than growing a tuber. But August is the time frame they really like to be planted. And this is the example of that picture I was talking about where we had some, actually had some failed cotton is what we had on this. This is part of a pivot and there's corn on one side because the, all the cotton was failed, but this side was dry land. It never got watered. So essentially this field here went 11 months with an inch of rain, two inches of rain. I think we had maybe at planting. And then we got a four inch rain in August. I mean, uh, yeah, in August is when we got it. And so we had four to five inches of rain in about a 12 month time period. And I was able to grow and germinate this cover crop here. And that's mainly due to the fact that, I mean, it was set out and we were just kind of kind of waiting. Um, and we also didn't go in and plow and, and list it up. But um, another, this is that same field um, taken January 10th. You can see the rye is still out there. The radish is kind of desiccated when we had the hard freeze in December. And I only put, I put 10 pounds of, it had some, some rye out there currently, but I put 10 pounds of rye with it just because you can't squeeze a drill down for two pounds. Um, planting rye. The other thing to keep in mind about radishes uh, that I know every year but I forget until they freeze and die is that they smell terrible. Um, when they die they smell like death or some animal has died or there's a gas leak and everybody's about to blow up is what a lot of the residents of Rawls thought. Um, turns out where my fields are on the north side of Rawls. I've grown some radishes in the past and had good luck with them on you know 60 acres here and there but this year we've got about 1,600 acres of radish um, that we planted all at that same time and got them all up. And so I have a large group of radishes together right north of Rawls. And after it froze and the wind shifted out of the north, um, there was lots of calls to Atmos Energy, as I was told, about gas leaks. 
Um, I, I haven't owned up to it. I guess I've told them myself now, but it was radishes is what it was. Even my own cousin at my uncle's house thought that there was a gas leak and called me out to look at it. And I got out there and I was like, oh, it's these radishes is what it is. And they smell terrible. So if you plant some and you got some neighbors out there, you may want to take them a, a, you know, a cookie cake or an edible arrangeable or something and maybe pre-apologize for when it freezes because they, they stink for about two weeks. Um, I like to call this, or thinking as I'm coming up here, at my Uncle Eddie slide. And my Uncle Eddie is my dad's oldest brother who I farm with and who I started farming a long time ago and, um, when I was just a little kid starting to drive a tractor. Because um, I talked with him a lot about making mistakes, because I made lots of mistakes as a young kid on the farm, um, mainly running things over. Um, and uh, I remember as a kid, I was driving a, a tractor with an offset on it. And I run, I run the, uh, <laughs> I run the outside two discs on this offset into a telephone pole, the leveling discs, and just ripped them off into the telephone pole. I think I was 11 at the time. And I called my uncle and told him what the deal was. And I was, all, I was expecting to get chewed out and told how terrible this was. And anyway, he had the patience of Job with me. And I, I really appreciate it. But he, he told me, he said, Christopher, the only person who's never messed up doing this is the person who's never done it. And that applies to lots of things in life, not just running an offset into a telephone pole um, and driving a tractor. And so, can we go to the next one? Um, and so that applies to my experience with cover crops also. I've made lots of mistakes growing cover crops. And I'll try to share a couple of my mistakes with y'all, so maybe y'all won't make those too. Um, but, you know, terminating a cover crop is, is always hard to do and you never really know. Um, depending on your soil type, depending on the year, um, depending on how much is it going to rain between now and planting. Um, and may, I can have a better idea of telling you when to terminate a cover crop, whether that's 30 or 60 days out or two weeks or whatever it may be. You know, if you know it's going to uh, rain a bunch, you want to take that cover crop longer, you know, then terminate it ahead of a, maybe a cash crop and um, try to hold the ground better. If it's going to stop raining now, not rain another drop, I want to go ahead and get it terminated now, you know. I'm not worried about it washing so much. I've got enough to cover the ground, but the rain's not going to deteriorate that cover crop anymore. And so if you're starting out hedging your bets is about the best advice I can offer. Um, I would tend to err on the side of terminating a touch early if you don't have as much experience planting into some real heavy trash. Because um, planting into heavy trash can be its own set of challenges. Um, and that brings me to my second point. Um, back up, yeah. Uh, is running a stock cutter over heavy wheat stubble. I did that. I took a a wheat crop real late on some drip and I thought I'm gonna be like these guys in the Midwest and I'm gonna plant into some big old tall cover and it's gonna be great and it's gonna look wonderful and then I sat around and got to looking at it and it probably would have been okay it was probably knee, it was some rye it was some knee high to maybe thigh high and it probably would have been okay if I hadn't done anything but I got to thinking and thinking I should start doing something to this and making it easier on myself so I thought I'm gonna run a stock cutter through it it sure looked good behind that stock cutter I mean, it mowed it down right where my planter was gonna be. It looked like it mulched, it looked perfect. And I thought, this is gonna be great. Well, I show up another week or two with a planter to go to planting it, and it was an absolute mess. Um, trying to get the moisture, the stubble was two or three inches thick. And instead of having all my wheat stubble standing up like this, or my rye stubble, you know, that I could have, in theory, you know, just planted down the middle of and had it facing one direction, my genius stock cutter idea had laid everything and woven it like a basket is what I had done with it. And so now it was hard to move, it's hard to get out of the way. And I planted it and it was a terrible stand. And I got to replant that cotton crop. Um, and so if you have some big tall cover, I've, I've run a stock cutter, tried to maybe get large radishes out of the way. Um, but if you have some, some heavy standing wheat stubble or trash, I think you'd be better off leaving as much anchored to the ground as you can and also try to leave it facing one direction. Because that's the other problem with heavy wheat stubble too, is it tends to get in behind gauge wheels and pin up next to opening discs uh, and make planting more difficult. Um, not letting cover go reproductive. Uh, hay grazer is the biggest one I, I would, I've learned this with, I would say over the years. I planted a lot of multi-species covers with hay grazer in it and hay grazer is good for a lot of things, but you don't want to let it go reproductive even if your, cover, your cash crop is going to be the next year. Um, I think hay grazer is great for, a, it's about the fastest warm season grass for establishing cover very quick, say on a hillside or something sloping hillside. If you're trying to get something to cover the ground, um, 
it works really good for that or grazing it. You got an animal you're gonna run across it, get them to eat it. But I was growing it a lot strictly for biomass to cover the ground um, and for a crop the next year is what I was doing. And I'd plant this stuff sometime during the summer after I got my cotton crop in, I'd plant it straight hay, you know, some sort of multi, but hay grazer was the dominant thing because hay grazer will get up and shade a lot of things out. And inevitably it would get to be about August or September and it was real close to heading out and I was too lazy and cheap to spend the money to terminate this stuff, either run a stalk cutter over it or to spray it with Roundup. And I'm thinking, well, our average first freeze date is the 31st October, it'd be the 1st October. I'm thinking, I'm just gonna let it go. I'll let it freeze get it. I'll save that one Roundup spraying. And I really did a good job. And it took me, it, it only took me about four or five years to figure out how much I was screwing up. And it was real obvious last year. Um, not only did I grow a bunch of weed seed for the next year in the form of volunteer hay grazer, because um, my other thought used to be, you know, even the Australians had told me not to let cover crops go reproductive. Um, you know, if it's like a wheat crop or a milo from the next year you're gathering money off of and selling, that's one thing. But if you're just growing it to grow it, you're better off not letting it go reproductive. Um, and my old thought was, well, that seed will lay on the ground and whatever it took out of the ground will go back into the earth. Well, it's not going to do it in the time frame you want it to do it, I can assure you. Um, it will not do it by the time your next cash crop is there, if that's within the next 12 months. Because I can see to the row, we had some corners where we mechanically terminated some hay grazer with a stalk cutter. And I can't remember, I think my guy had to go to lunch or something, but it ended up raining. So we did half of these couple of blocks, something like that, mechanically terminated. The rest of them headed out. And this was dry land this last year, and you could see to the exact row where he quit with that stalk cutter because where the hay grazer headed out, it didn't produce any harvestable bubble of cotton. The dry land where it did wasn't great, don't get me wrong, but it produced fiber. It produced you know, an extra one or 200 pounds, you know, that the, the part where it headed out didn't produce anything. And so any cover, letting them go reproductive, I would advise against, but especially hay grazer. Um, and you try to terminate it or get rid of it. Because I saved that one Roundup spraying, and this last year I got to add an extra two to three Roundup sprayings to try to kill a bunch of volunteer hay grazers. So that was really uh, good math on my part. And if you're looking to get started, I'd say the easiest, especially with maybe potential wheat prices where we have some wheat out here, is just cutting a wheat crop and planting cotton straight into it for cotton guys around here or any kind of crop. But planting cotton into standing wheat stubble is about the easiest thing that there is, especially if, you know, if it's not 70 or 80 bushel wheat stubble, that can present problems and challenges. But you also want to make sure that your combine is spreading that trash out evenly behind the, you know, when your chaff spreader, or it's got a header that can spread it out. But planting cotton in behind a, you know, wheat stubble that's about this big is really about the easiest thing to start with if you're, if you're looking to get started in it. Okay, some 80 inch cotton notes here at the end. Um, we've done 80 inch for a few years and then really got a lot bigger into it with the Australian program. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in an 80 inch, or, and when I say 80 inch, I mean wide row. That could be 60s or 80s or 90s, or there's some guys doing 120s, but whatever your version of basically wider than 40 inches is, is what I'm talking about. And we experimented a lot with really low rates on, say, 40 inch row patterns. Um, and that, I think that has its place, but I think our seeding rate even needs to be lower than what we can go on 40s because the problem you run into on 40s or any conventional row spacing is you just, your gaps get so large. Um, and whether it's a cotton stripper or a cotton picker does not like gaps when you're trying to harvest the stuff. You start pulling up cotton plants, it starts making a mess, dropping cotton on the ground. And so going to every other row type of deal like we did is a way we could get our population low enough like we wanted it to match our water or irrigation capacities, uh, but not have these large gaps in it. And so, you know, we immediately see, we know there's increased water use efficiency, increased nutrient efficiency. We've reduced our ni nitrogen by 60 to 70% um, on the thing. And as I've said, the cotton will compensate for the gaps. You know, when you think of cotton as a factory, it's a factory that cranks up and produces cotton. Anything you're gonna build from the ground up has a startup cost. And all that seed, that stalk, those plants have a startup cost in moisture requirements and in nutrient requirements. And if a cotton plant, as we know, is, a, is an indeterminate plant, um, there is no set number of ears that it's gonna set like a corn plant or it's gonna grow one or two maybe. 
a cotton plant can put on six positions or it can put on 200 um, in this part of the world, kind of what I've seen. And so we can really compensate and make up for these gaps. Um, there are some learning curves we have, we have to treat wide row cotton different, but where we're seeing the water use efficiency and the nitrogen efficiency is the big thing, where we're just not having to grow as many plants. Because as cotton farmers, you know you are, anybody who's not, anybody who's ever walked a cotton field has seen and known, we all see those plants by themselves. You know, the row has, you know, 10 or 12 bowls on it on those plants, and there's one by itself that has 150. And I don't think there's a single farmer in here that hadn't said, hey, I need to figure out how to grow a whole field of these, you know. You don't have a lot less seed cost in this, and this looks like a lot better plant it is. Well, this is the, what we're trying to do with this, essentially. Um, but some things to be mindful of with the, with the 80s. Um, I mean, obviously, I think you know, slowing down and getting good seed to soil contact where you're planting a lot less seed, emergence is a lot more key. Um, um, picks is a big one, starting out with picks, especially on any you know, irrigated crop, even as lightly irrigated. Wide row cotton is gonna to want to tend to get even growthier than what it normally would, or it doesn't have a neighbor. And so start picking this stuff early and stay consistent with it. You know, every week to two weeks, you know, if you're irrigating it, it's gonna need some sort of picks on it. Doesn't have to be a bunch, but depending on how hot it is, how dry it is, it needs some picks continuously throughout the season. And then tom tomorrow to preface all of this, Tate and Steven are gonna be up here talking about wide row too, and they're much better farmers than me, so they'll tell y'all more about wide row cotton, but um, crop insurance is the other thing you gotta look out for um, and just be mindful going in is, you know, you're essentially on 80s, it's all set off 40 inch rows. So on 80s, if I take 60 acres and plant 80 inch cotton on it, I'm basically certifying or turning into insurance that I've planted 30 acres is what that, what that means. Cause I've planted one in and one out. So I'm showing that I've planted half of the acres. And so you need to know that going into it. And that's, I think why the best fit to begin with on some wide row, if somebody's starting it is on a light water drip field, light water pivot, um, dry land is tough to start with especially if you don't have a full profile. Um, you really need a full profile for, for wide row stuff. Um, and that would be my determining factor on dry land planting. If you don't have a full profile, then I would probably stick with my normal row pattern to have the safety of crop insurance. But if you have a year where you have a good full profile, especially if it's been rotated, then I think that'd be a good time to plant some wide row dry land. Um, but that's why for guys starting out, if it's a light water pivot, which we know light water irrigation is what we got a lot of in this country. Um, light water farms are the ones that no matter how much you plant, the low you plant on 30s or 40s, that stuff, you won't get much help. It's gonna end up burning up in August is what it's gonna do. Um, and that's where these 80s to me really shine is on light water stuff. And they, they work good on higher input stuff and that's more Tate's area of expertise, um, but then it takes even more management. Um, so full profile on dry land, you can back up one. And that's the other deal on, I touched it on the dry land, but the root development. And I want to say this, and this is something that the Australians have preached since I've been in the group for two or three years, and I've known this as a cotton farmer, but been too hard-headed to realize it or to implement it, is where cotton is a perennial plant and we grow it as an annual, it's so much different than a, a grass like corn that grows its roots and it's above ground, it shoots, you know, essentially kind of at the same time. A cotton plant or any perennial is gonna put its energy in growing a root system first because it thinks it's gonna be here for the long haul. And so it's gonna invest that energy in a root system so it can come back next year. And historically what I've done in the past, and I would say I'm not different than most other cotton farmers is, you know, we get our cotton crop planted and, you know, start in May and replant up until June and then middle to end of June shows up and that's about when our severe weather's over into June. And that's traditionally we're like, well, we've got to fire up and start watering these cotton plants because of two things. Number one, I mean, the big part is cotton always looks like, it looks terrible at the end of June. Uh, the thrips have eat on it, the wind's blown it around, right? Sand's beat up on it. It generally looks terrible at the end of June. And us as farmers and caretakers, we think we're doing it a favor by watering this crop. And I think we've done nothing but hinder it uh, by watering it you know, earlier, because we can't build a profile underneath the cotton crop while it's already, while it's already up. Um, I think there'd need to be some talk, some research done to maybe this idea of maybe doing a little bit of pre-watering, because deal with any cotton crop is what I found out and, and learned more from the Australians about this, any cotton crop, but especially on wide row, and what you want to avoid on wide row is 
the thing that makes wide row, wide row cotton is the root system on it. And if you don't grow a wide row root system, and I've done a bunch of this, you have a wide row cotton field and you got 40 inch plants in it is what you got. Because I didn't let the root system develop. And then you'll be very disappointed at harvest, I can assure you. Um, and so letting that root system develop, we do that, I mean, through a few ways. Number one, trying to, if you're on irrigation, trying to have a profile when you plant or on dry land having a profile, but then not watering as long as we possibly can, you know, so that those, if we start watering that cotton crop, we've just made a, an addict out of it is what we've done. And that root system doesn't seem to need, see the need to grow any further once we've started watering it. And so if we'll let that plant even stress a little bit early, and instead of building a 100 horsepower root system, let's build a 500 horsepower root system underneath it. So that when it gets into August and it's got multiple positions, it's got seven, eight positions on a branch, it can support that. And it doesn't have a root system this big. You know, it's got one that's meeting its neighbor, you know, 80 or 90 inches away, is what I think is the most important takeaway on anybody trying any wide row um, on any of this stuff is trying to delay. And, and even on 40s, I think it's of great benefit is trying to, I don't think we're doing this cotton any service by watering it in June and maybe not even in July, depending on how dry it is. But that's up to every situation, depending on your irrigation capacity, how quick can you put that first inch out, things like that. But I think we need to try pushing this irrigation back as far as we can. And one other note on the crop insurance I realized I missed. Where you are planting, you know, you're turning in, you're insuring half the acres. Uh, but say I've planted a 60 acre half in 80s, I've essentially planned my insurance sees I've planted 30 acres. Well, if I grow a thousand pound to the land acre crop, I harvest that off of that farm. I don't turn in a thousand pounds to be added to my APH, I turn in 2,000 pounds because it's what it is to the, to the planted acre, not to the land acre. I consider yielding to the land acre because I'm comparing it back to my 40 inch system. But since I've only planted, I harvested a thousand pounds, you know, to the land acre on 60 acres, that's 2,000 pounds. So for a low water pivot, being able to turn in a 2,000 pound average yield to my APH works pretty well over, over some time, if I can do that. And so, yeah, there are some trade-offs, you know, on not having full coverage, you need to know that going into it, but you're paying half the premium and can generally, it's a good way to try to help raise some of these yields up on, you know, maybe some of these lower yielding farms. I wanted to add that before I forgot. Um, anyway, that's just kind of a picture of a plant and back up. You can kind of see, not a great example, the last picture I was probably, but you can see how it spreads out and tries to compensate, you know, by adding lots of other positions, you know, one plant would normally if we, you know, when I'm planting 40,000 seeds to the acre, you go pull one plant up and it's this spindly limmy thing and it's got about five bowls on it is what it's got. Um, and it's just amazing what cotton will do um, when we give it the opportunity and give it the space. And this is just a picture I had to stick in here. Um, as I like, I like looking at it, it's from two years ago, it's on some dry land. And that ended up making uh, two bales to the land acre on dry land. So it made four bales to the row right out west of Cone. Uh, but this year we had some rain too. So anyway, it's, it's very possible to do it. And it's amazing when it does it and there's still a lot we have to learn. Uh, but that's just kind of some of the things that I've noticed over the years. So anyway, if anybody's got any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer those. Yes, sir. Okay, you're ready to get cotton. Let me give you this, Bob. Based, based on your pictures, it looks like you're in a clay loam soil. Yes, sir. And you made the statement that you need to start with a full profile, which I think is real wise. So my question is, um, is this 80 inch cotton more of an opportunity or is it a strategy? Since it would take, you know, four to six inches of water to fill a profile, if you were dry, would you expend that uh, moisture expense to fill the profile to farm at 80 inches? Or are you looking at, at it more as an opportunity where if you have a full profile from natural rainfall, fall, that you would opt to go with 80 inch cotton? Well, I th that's a good question. I think it can be seen as both. I think for sure right now, as the insurance stands on dry land, it's an opportunity on dry land if I have a full profile on dry land. On my irrigated stuff, even my lot water is where I've got a lot of 80 inch stuff. I am gonna expend the, 
the money and the time to, to irrigate it because I can be, I believe and I, that the the water that I put out pre-watering I will easily gain back by delaying my watering in the season you know instead of starting the middle of June maybe I'm not going to be watered until the middle or end of July so I would have spent that water, but I would have spent it more in the heat of the spring or the early summer, as opposed to maybe watering in, you know, now or March, which I think would be a more efficient use of the water. Irrigation rates are lower, evaporation is a lot less. And so that's my strategy this year is to try to do a little bit more pre-watering, but I don't think I'm gonna be adding any more total water to my usage, maybe potentially less uh, than what I normally would have instead of just cranking up in June and just go until, you know, till it quits. Um, I think I can get that back by delaying my first irrigation. What is your goal on, on irrigation or on your pre-water? Do you have a certain how much you put out or how deep your profile is? I, I don't. You know, I've got one of those probes that probes about five or six foot. Um, we're going to get a, a couple of moisture probes this year to try to help us out with some of that, Barry. Um, and I think some of this technology was, is really good. It's come a long way. And last year was the first year I looked at some of it. And, I think that's going to be a really good tool, um, but I don't have a great answer. It kind of depends on the, lip, the irrigation capacity of the pivot, but, you know, like to be able to put out, you know, probably two or three inches, three or four inches, something like that, but sometimes we're limited by logistics. Why is it so important that the wide row cotton start with a profile? Uh, for, for root development, and I didn't, maybe I didn't finish fully explaining that thought, is on root development of cotton, is cotton isn't going to grow into dry soil. Um, and, and so when cotton hits dry soil, the roots are, are they're going to stop growing there. And so if we start with a profile, as that ground slowly dries down from the top, the cotton roots are below and they're constantly searching and pushing out and trying to find more moisture um, if, we have, if we haven't started watering by then. And that's why the delayed irrigation is so important. But as that profile naturally dries from the top down, those cotton roots are forced to go further and deeper and wider into the soil profile and be, build um, um, the, the large root system like we want. And so it's important to start with that because once you've planted that crop, you can't add the profile to it while the roots are in the ground. Otherwise, it will hinder their development. Yes, sir. Are you watering with a spray nozzle or a uh, bubbler? Or? I, I'm, I'm planning on watering with a bubbler is my plan. I've never been a huge fan of spray nozzles um, other than germ trying to germinate a crop. My plan is just to water to run my bubblers, but just run them just about as slow as I can run them, you know, without having water run into pivot tracks and make ruts and make a mess. But just trying to slow them down enough to where we're letting that water soak across, you know, as long as possible and run them really slow. Are you trying to bubble in between the rows or We're bubbling in between the rows. On my pivots, what I'm doing, and there's some guys who are, who are doing it, some of the other guys, Tate can probably speak to more of this tomorrow. I think he plants his cotton in a straight line, and so he kind of waters everywhere. But I've been planting my 80s still in a circle, um, and I'm planting my 80s on top of the old bed. Um, I tried it straight before, and I may revisit it this year. I haven't decided, but the pivot tracks are rough. Driving across it, planting across pivot tracks was rough. That's why I got away from it. I know you hear some guys talk about, you know, straight rows, see some yield bump and improvement, and I believe that's right, you know, based on the way the sun and earth move around. But um, so far what I'm doing is I'm just planting at the top of the same bed I was, it's just every other bed. So my bubbler is off to the side. Uh, a couple of questions. Are you planting any dry soil in the cover crops? Yes, every eight. Every acre of my dryland is planted to cover crop, or, or half of it is. It's just like my irrigated system, everything's half and half. And that's why I'm, in our system, it's I've got cover on that I'm planting. Most of my dryland acres have a cover or grew enough cover last year, but having that year to set out and having that opportunity of an entire calendar year, um, kind of like you were talking about earlier, where we're trying to butt a crop up every year in a dry and a very arid climate, it's difficult to then, I think put a cover crop in there too. I think we have to have some kind of break. And I think even Tate, he could tell us more tomorrow, maybe even takes a longer break than a year on some of his stuff in a dryland system has had really good success with it. And then one more question. You mentioned it, but do you have anyone doing the <coughs> real cotton? I mean, I don't know if it kills it at harvest. Or well, the, he's asking if anybody's doing any perennial cotton. I, I'm not, maybe in some other part of the world. I, here, you know, it does freeze and gets cold enough. 
um, and then also because of you know boll weevil program and stuff like that you don't want it continuing to live or try to do more of that but it will eventually freeze you know even if we don't defoliate it so in this part of the world it just gets too cold seed population here. Uh, seed population my wide row uh, kind of varies on my dry land uh, the lowest i can put my planter is 23,000. so if i'm doing dry land or really limited water really low water i just cut that in half and i'm doing about 12,000 to the acre um, is what i'm doing i found you know that 23,000, 24 on my planter you know with some of the seed quality i get sometimes i can still have some gaps even at that and so you know without culling seed you know doing some of that that's about the lowest i've gone is about that 12,000. i start to see a, a few gaps after that but I, you can go lower um, maybe slowing the planter down, maybe making sure you got good hot seed. My irrigated, I'm about, I don't know, anywhere from probably 15 to 18,000, I think is where I was at this last year. Can you talk a little bit about your planter? What, what do you run on the front of it and closing wheels and all? How, how, do, you, how do you do that? Uh, we run a case planter, um, and so you know, like the offset discs on the front for cutting through stuff, but then we've got uh, a Yetter. Uh, spiked trash wheels with a depth band up on the front. They free float, um, uh, or you know you can adjust them. Uh, but ideally, you know if you got enough cover and it's not super sloppy wet, you just kind of let them free float, move a little bit of trash out of the way. We're trying to move a little trash, you know, not a ton of dirt. Really, we're not trying to move any dirt. And then on the back, we've got vertical closing discs. You know, they're a little bit different. You know, the the stock ones on the case are smooth, but we've got either some spiked or this year some of the shark teeth. Uh, concave um, uh, vertical closing discs on the back um, is the only only modifications we've made to the planter. Uh, Chris, when you plant into a full soil profile, how soon do you start the water behind behind that? Um, I think that was Mr. Harms. I can't see where he was coming from. There he is, right over there. Um, that's a good question. You know, the Australians will tell you when it starts wilting in the morning is when you start watering. Um, but I comes back some practicality of how much what's your irrigation capacity um, I've got some pivots that are just big humidifiers and so you know it may take two and a half weeks you know two weeks to make a slow circle you know on some of these low water pivots and so I think every farm is different everybody's got to kind of make that determination on their own but you know I don't know if I could go till it was wilting in the morning I'm, I'm, I've basically been pushing it back about two weeks you know week to two weeks every year and I made it to the middle of July this year but Maybe I'd see if I can get to the end of July this year before we start watering. It's kind of my thinking, but that kind of varies on the year and rainfall. It's, it's really hard to say. You may have already answered this, but I was busy butchering the IT. <laughs> um, what do you think the top end of the 80 inch cotton is? Once again, that's another better question for Tate. Uh, or, you know, somebody who does a better job there, or Walker, you know, if he's here, uh, or Patrick. But, uh, you know, I've heard of four bells to the land acre, some guys growing um, in this part of the world um, is, is kind of what I've heard. I think the potential is more. Um, I think we're just now kind of figuring out how to manage this stuff. Um, and I think that that's really the key. But four bales is what I've heard. We've grown 16, 1,650 pounds. I think it's the best I've done. Not quite 1,700 pound cotton to the land acre um, last year or two and years ago. When you grew the 1,000 pound dry land, uh, did you did anyone question turning in a, a four bale APH yield for for that? Well, that was it. Didn't look as appealing. That was on just on one side of the field. The other, the north side got hailed out. The south side did. But yes, I did have that question from my insurance agent when we turned in on that sixteen hundred pound count. We turned in a thirty one to thirty two hundred pound yield. You know, called and was wondering. You know, what's the deal with some of this stuff? You know, is this real? Is this you know? But I mean, it's all. It's all on the up and up, but yes, you do kind of get some questions when you turn in some of those yields. Yep. There is what it is, um, but yeah, there is a side to it, but. Tabler. <laughs> That's right. Different ones you've planted, behavioral between the two on a wider row, uh, which one did we like better? There, there, there is a lot of difference for a wide row, and I, um, I, I can't say, you know, 
I, I thought this was true till this year, but then my taller kite seemed to do better. But you kind of you want one that will tend to you know put on multiple positions because there are varieties that that will you know I had one variety this year it wanted to put on consistently. That was one of the pictures I had you know seven positions on on a branch, and then there's some that it would never get past five to six, um, and so you, you know kind of looking for you know a variety which is kind of hard to look for because most seed company you know aren't I don't have test plots of this and so it's kind of hard to look at or it's not rated in the catalog of 40s and wide row you know and fruiting you know how it fruits and so but seems to me looking for uh, maybe a little bit more compact plant kind of saves you a little bit of trouble on your picks because you're already picking a lot anyway with even with a compact variety I mean trying to find one that wants to get squatty you know and kind of branch out we know there's certain varieties that want to get tall like a christmas tree and some that tend to want to stay a little bit more broad those broader ones tend to be seem to have had more success with so far on the wide row yes sir where you find your phosphorus and where are you find it in the bed we're we're doing some phosphorus um in fura um, is what we're doing at planting along with some other micronutrients is where we're when we're doing that. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a question. I can't sit up here and say that I've cracked this dry land. What's that? Can you repeat the question? Oh, um, on the dry land. Am I going, going half and half on the dry land? Do I feel like I'm given up any potential you know income you know on the dry land and i think there there's i mean there's probably no doubt to that you know especially if you especially a year like last year you know where i'd been much better off planting every acre you know with a dollar four insurance i'd be much better off but um I, i've found it's difficult to outguess insurance price and the weather um you know if if, if i'd done that i also wouldn't have had two bale dry land you know the year before either and so it's hard to it's hard to say I'm trying to get the dry land to where it's to a point where it's sustainable you know because right now for us for ourselves our dry land farming operation is not sustainable the way we're doing it you know with without large infusements infusions of crop insurance money our dry land farming system is not sustainable and so trying to figure out a way because there, there's no doubt my irrigated is what's pulling the train you know on our operation it's not the dry land um, and so, yes, I feel that we probably are um, giving some up, but uh, we're just trying to get to a point where maybe we can make this thing work year in and year out. And I, you know, if insurance, if we can go to, you know, be able to in fully insure wide row cotton, I think will be a, another step in that right direction. But um, it's kind of still the same thing on, on rotating um, on, and doing half. If I don't do half, then I can't, and I still can't guarantee it, but. I haven't ever missed a cover crop yet or having cover on that ground. If I'm flat, you have to have a cover um, where I'm flat. Otherwise, I'm going to end up plowing or running a sand fighter to try to stop the dirt from blowing at some point in time. And I can't reliably grow a cover in my part of the world unless I'm laying it out. And so I've just basically decided that the acres I'm going to have a dry land are just going to be half of what I got so that I can ensure that I grow a cover. Okay. We have just a couple more minutes. People want to ask more questions for Chris. Hey, Chris, on your on your cover crops, have you done any more integrating of livestock or try to get, get any more of an income stream out of them than what you did when you started? I haven't. Um, I should. Um, you know, we, we graze a little bit. I should, I'm not grazing like I should, you know, moving things around or trying to make that an income stream. And I see Kelly's talk, and Kelly's doing sheep, and um, talks about how much more profitable they are than cows. and. I, always, I leave these meetings feeling gung-ho about I'm going to get some sheep or some cows and um, then life hits me in the face with two boys and um, you know a family and trying to do some of that and uh, I need to be doing more of that and maybe a time will come for that but uh, as one guy said I, I need to but I'm just not right now uh, I just I just don't have the time for it or the manpower do we have anything else On the, your land one, you know, they, they talk about your land wants to be covered and your plants going to be put nuts. So it wants to be covered by mm -hmm. something, so weed's going to come up and grow. So when your 80 inch rows, you're going to have a lot of area for weeds to want to try to come up. 
You can, you can, and it's potentially, you know, where we're able to grow some cover, you know, we, we reduce the area that's exposed to sunlight, you know, and some of that, and that helps a lot. But, I mean, the, and this goes back to disturbances, what RN was talking about, whether it's chemical or physical, um, you know, where we don't plow, you know, we're relying on chemical disturbance. And where we're also trying to keep careless weeds, you know, from being a main nuisance, uh, we have lots of overlapping residuals. And so I haven't seen any, anywhere where my wide row is any weedier than my 40 inch stuff. I'm not saying we, we do get weeds, of course, but they're no worse than my, my 40 inch cotton. I mean, 40 inch in our part of the world takes so long to shade, and unless it's good irrigated, it didn't shade it anyway, you know, until much later in the year. And so um, I, I, there's, I haven't seen an increased weed control cost in my 80s. It's the same high cost as it is on my 40s trying to control um, resistant careless weed. So. Yeah. Uh, how is your volunteer cotton? Because I know you're, you're continuing to cotton farmer. That's one of our struggles. But how is your? How does that help you with volunteer cotton? And if you do have a deal with a pretty bad volunteer cotton, how do you how do you take care of that? Yeah, that's the, the rotation is the best, and I cuss the uh, three or four fields I have that are cotton on cotton every year. I cuss them and I cuss myself for not being more diligent about rotating, but they're the farmers with better water um, and you know, generally drip and stuff like that is what they are. And so um, where we're rotating this ground, volunteer is essentially not a, not a problem at all. I mean, it's non-existent, volunteer cotton. Um, where I'm cotton, growing a cover in between, stuff like that, it, it is definitely an issue. Um, and we, we're rigging up and making deals. And I mean, basically we've come, we just, with an 80 inch hood is what we've come up with or kind of rigged uh, 40 inch lay by hood is what we're using clay um, going in between kind of next to the row and trying to get as early as we can um, while that cotton is small because you know even on any hood we're still going to have a gap you know you're still going to have a little bit of, potentially a little bit of volunteer next to it um, where we're planting 80 inch cotton we do have the freedom to move a little bit and so maybe right where that volunteer may potentially be the worst in the row a lot of times where it dropped it from last year we try to move off of that so that's straight underneath the hood for the next year but there's no doubt the cotton on cotton volunteer is an issue um, i'm not saying you know it's, it's blasphemous running a, a, a shallow sweep or something we'll probably work the best i haven't done that because uh, plowing with cover and dragging and kind of balling up we just haven't done it but we're running a hood to try to clean it up but it's definitely an issue Let me ask you one, one other, whenever you talk about planting radishes and rye, do you do any herbicide or anything on that? Or, or I, I didn't this year. Um, I was always afraid he's going to hurt my radish. I'm not saying you can't. We, on some, most of these fields where they were rye before that, and my rye was real hit or miss because it was so dry. On some of them, while we were going out, while I was spraying, you know, maybe you know, dual over the top of my cotton, some of these might, got a, you know, might hit them with maybe a shot of dual or just a straight shot of Dirax you know, a month or so before we're thinking about planting. And I, kind of two schools of thought, I've just, I've just done it one year or did it a little bit this year. Um, if you don't get any rain, you're not gonna have any weeds and your herbicide's not gonna be incorporated. You don't have to worry about the herbicide messing with your weeds. Um, and if you do get a rain, um, hopefully that will start then breaking down your herbicide to where maybe your radish crop can come up. I don't, I don't have a great answer. I never did with any multi-species cover crop of herbicides that go with them. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, it's planting, you know, for even when you get to two things, when you get a broadleaf and a grass, it's difficult to have any kind of selective herbicide. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. You know, on some of this stuff, I found if you can maybe go in there, start clean, maybe you do a burn down ahead of the drill if you've got some issue and then you plant and try to start clean with it. And then, you know, try to get your, your cover up or your radishes established to where they can grow. Because if you can have something good and growing is the best herbicide to have. But there's no doubt you can walk in my radishes and find some, some careless weeds and some weeds here, um, you know, all over the place. It's not taken over, but it, I, I don't have a great solution to it. Right, anything else? Chris, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing with us.